So I'll start with um, uh, some background. This is uh, information taken from Scott Atran, who is probably the leading researcher on terrorism or radicalization. He's based in France. Uh, he's an anthropologist, and he, he, uh, he carries out uh, interviews with uh, people involved in terrorism, both family members and former terrorists. And he has uh, collected statistics uh, across many dimensions in his work on terrorism. And currently, something like 25% of French youth, not just Muslims, but all French youth, are sympathetic to ISIS. And of 11 ISIS sympathizers, he interviewed after a, a, a plan to blow up parts of Barcelona, five of them were non-Muslims. They didn't come from a Muslim background. So this is a real problem. How do you identify which individuals are likely or potential candidates for radicalization? Now, this is all background. The, the uh, one strategy for addressing this issue is to collect large amounts of data and then use statistical uh, techniques, pattern recognition techniques, big data methodologies in order to try and create uh, filters or um, identify dimensions within this, these data which would be relevant for predicting radicalization. Now there are two ways of approaching methodologies like this. One way is purely statistical where you, you use uh, black box statistical pattern recognition in order to uh, generate the patterns which will be salient to your needs. The other way, broadly speaking, is um, an ontology-based way. That is to say, it's based upon not merely a blind statistical view of the data, but it's based upon theories of how the data is organized or on how the world is organized which involve the use of terminologies which identify specific types of phenomena within the world that the data is about. Now, um, you all, all of you who have an iPhone at least, have ontologies in your pocket. Since the uh, Siri app in your iPhone is based on ontologies of simple things like restaurants and movies and traffic and weather and so forth. Now, the world's first ontology was almost certainly created by Aristotle when he wrote his theory of categories. And you remember an ontology-based methodology for understanding a body of data, big data rests upon finding a terminologically, uh, sorry, a theoretically useful terminology for describing the world that the data is about. This is a terminologically useful classification of things like organisms. Aristotle also had a terminologically useful classification of constitutions. So there are true constitutions, perverted constitutions, uh, there are theoretical constitutions and real constitutions. Uh, Aristotle himself collected something of the order of a thousand different constitutions. He had the world's first database. Unfortunately, it was lost, so we don't have his collection of constitutions. But it, it's possible to reconstruct his ontology of constitutions by examining his, um, the, what, what we have of his writings. Now, there was a big gap between Aristotle and the 20th century. Various ontologically important things happened during that gap. But the, uh, the first... Uh, important things which happened which are relevant to our uh, subject matter today happened in round about the 1970s when the word ontology began to be used by computer people working on AI and on robotics. And in 2001, Tim Berners-Lee and some of his colleagues published a paper in, the, in Scientific American in which they unveiled the project of a web ontology language called OWL. The idea behind OWL was that 
data on the web, information on the web, everything on the web at the, at the moment is collected and formatted in a, an unsystematic and inconsistent way. If we could create some kind of consistent way of describing the data in the web, so that data about refrigerators collected by one organization could be combined with data about refrigerators collected by another organization, and we could reason across the combined set of data, then we would turn the web into something that would be much more useful than the mere chaotic collection which it seemed in, 19, in 2001. And so OWL was created as a, um, a language, it's a web ontology language, which was designed to allow more consistent compilation of web artifacts, which would allow reasoning, because there is a logic inside OWL. Now, an ontology nowadays is very often formulated using OWL as its language. There are other ontology languages, but OWL is a de facto standard language for ontology in many circles. And an ontology itself is a terminology, it's a controlled vocabulary, but it's a controlled vocabulary which is used to tag data or to tag literature in such a way that that data and that literature can be reasoned over, the data and literature can be combined, the content of the data and the literature can be retrieved because the tagging, which is uh, created using these standardized ontologies, allows data which cre is created by many heterogeneous sources to be treated as if it were created by one single source. Ideally, anyway. It's not always easy to do any of this, but this is the ideal. And that's what the ontologies in the iPhone, in Siri, do. They you, they are used to tag information about restaurants and weather and traffic and so forth in such a way that the app can then reason with that data and give you useful information. Now what we are trying to do, or what people are trying to do, organizations across the world are trying to do, is to create ontologies or similar artifacts which can be used to carry out the same sort of reasoning across data about things like radicalization and terrorism. Now, the OWL Semantic Web Initiative was uh, running in the 1990s. Um, it was uh, relatively unscientific in the sense that OWL was not used by scientists very much. If it was used, it was used in very experimental ways. Completely independently of the semantic web, in 1998, which is the year that the Human Genome Project was completed, the original Human Genome Project, also the year when many other fly, mouse, uh, rat genome projects were completed. In that year, there was created the gene ontology. Now, the gene ontology was not created by computer scientists. It was created by biologists. And it's a terminology of biology. Um, this terminology was then used to tag genomic information. So if you have the mouse genome over here and you have the human genome over there, and you understand that this particular gene sequence or this particular protein sequence is associated with cell death, let's say, in the mouse, because you can do experiments on mice, then you can infer that the same sequence or a similar sequence in the human genome might also be relevant to cell death. And so a new kind of biology arose, a cross-species genome-based biology, where people could do experiments on non-human organisms and draw conclusions for what might be the case in humans because of the similarities across the gene sequences. But for this, you need a consistent species-neutral terminology of biology. And that's what the gene ontology is. It's not an ontology of genes. It's an ontology of biology, a big ontology of biological processes 
cellular components, molecular functions combine together to help biologists do cross-species, cross-disciplinary biology. Now, the gene ontology is, scientifically speaking, hugely successful. It's the, the one single most con conspicuous uh, successful ontology that we have. It's still used, it's growing, it's still being funded in very generous ways. And it's generated a number of sister ontologies, such as the cell, the protein ontology, and so forth, which were combined together to form something called the ovo foundry, which is uh, the, the part of ontology where I have done my uh, the, the most of my work thus far. And in connection with the ovo foundry, we created a, um, a, a an artifact which is designed to serve. I have a handout, on which is one. Um, we published a, a handbook about building ontologies, which is based on BFO. BFO is the, the, the ontological structure underlining not just the gene ontology, but all these other ontologies. It's a top-level ontology. And um, so this is the handout. Nowadays, there are actually, it's, up, it's more now, it's 250 ontology initiatives which are using BFO as the starting point for ontology development. <coughs> Not just in biology, but also in various other areas. So these are some of the areas. So these are the biology ontologies. And then we have various other ontologies, including an ontology of experiments and an ontology of information artifacts. Um, but we also have various uh, groups who are imitating the Ovo Foundry initiative and developing similar initiatives in other areas, such as geography, um, the United Nations Environment Program, but most importantly, the military, and even more importantly for today's purposes, the intelligence community. So that they all have ontologies which they are developing as suites of interoperable modules like these, based on BFO, to span large domains. The idea is that if you use a common top-level ontology, then the domain ontologies that you create about more specific things, such as cells or cell cycles, will be, to a greater degree, interoperable with each other because they have a common architecture or a common top-level structure. Now, one of the applications of the BFO-based strategy for creating ontologies is to the phenomena, phenomenon of terrorism, um, or more generally, to the phenomena around the Iraq-Afghanistan wars. And um, the, so the, the, the problem here is that terrorism are, uh, applies or... Terrorist data can be about practically anything. It can be about economics, politics, religion, education. It can be about skills. It can be about languages. It can be about money. And so any ontology to deal with terrorism would have to be almost an ontology of everything. And so we actually built the, a, a step towards an ontology of everything in order to help with the goal of creating a framework which would allow us to tag terrorism data in useful ways. And it was useful, so we have uh, um, evidence that what we built would actually do things which were useful to the people who were using it. It's called a Common Core Ontologies. This is just a snapshot of the, top of the first three levels. Uh, some of it is available in the public domain if anybody is interested. And it's based on BFO, and then we have the Common Core, which are about things like agents and artifacts. And then we have various domain ontologies for things like citizenship or watercraft or units of measure and so on. Now, what this is used for is graph theoretical tagging, you might say. So this is um, a picture of how it's being used to tag data 
about a, a particular kind of terrorist phenomenon in both Iraq and Afghanistan, whereby terrorists would poison wells with bacteria in order to uh, shake the stability of the relevant village which used the well as its water source. And so there were attempts to collect data about well poisoning. And that means the bacteria used, time of day when the well was poisoned, where the well was in relation to the village and so forth. So you have lots of quantitative information here and also lots of qualitative information, including the names of the villages, the, um, um, the meeting where the civil military uh, personnel met with the key leaders in the village to discuss the consequences of the well poisoning and so forth. And we can see how this was structured. This is a, a very simplified view of BFO that we have, on the one hand, things which continue, such as people, planets, and so forth. And on the other hand, we have things which occur, such as meetings, processes, generally. And there are sites, attributes of things, and then there are information artifacts, such as reports. And so cholera is a special kind of attribute. It's a disposition. The disease of cholera doesn't necessarily have to show signs, but you, if you have cholera, then you have the disposition to so, show signs of the disease. Then the meeting with the key leaders is a process. This person is an object, and this village is a site, and that report is an information artifact. So BFO enables you to apply a common approach to ontology building to data about things like meetings in villages and wells in villages and diseases and so forth. Now, if we're going to create an ontology for such meetings or for such poisonings, then what we do is we create a list of terms that we need in our ontology. We, we try and create a list which involves terms already in common use, and then we try and find definitions using BFO as our starting point, or using already existing ontologies as our starting point. And the definitions should be logical definitions in the sense that we can formalize them using OWL or some other ontology language, and then use computers to reason with the data which is tagged with those terms. These are tags, which, because they are logically defined, create graph-theoretic connections like the ones illustrated here. And those graph theoretic connections then enable reasoning across bodies of data. And uh, so we have terms for continuance here, <coughs> villages, reports, terms for occurrences such as meetings, and uh, we have also terms for other kinds of uh, phenomena which are going to be important when we build an ontology of terrorism with special attention now, not to Iraq and Afghanistan, but to ISIS. So nearly everything I say from now on is specifically related to the phenomenon of terrorism, particularly in Europe, uh, in the name of ISIS. So this is a real puzzle. Why do young people in Europe become radicalized in this peculiar way. We have a lot of data, but we don't know how to understand that data. The, the idea is that we build an ontology in such a way that we can capture usefully some of the structure in that data in ways which may help us to make predictions, which would be useful then in their own right. And in order to build this ontology, we need to understand what terrorism is, what a terrorist act is, what a terrorist group is, where a terrorist group is formed, what is it in the environment which is enabling a terrorist group to be formed. And so a lot of what I'm going to be saying next will be about environments. All right, now, the, uh, the view of terrorism which started the, uh, the, the philosophical literature, anyway, on terrorist phenomena is rooted in something called speech act theory. 
Speech act theory was anticipated by Thomas Reed in the 18th century, who had the idea that there are not just solitary acts of thinking and, and speaking to yourself, uh, but there are also social acts which are such that they must be directed towards some other person. An example would be promising. You can't promise privately. A promise has to involve at least one other person. So it's a social act. When you make a promise, then you create a small society. And as long as the promise obligation obtains, that small society will exist. Now, the, in the 20th century, this idea was taken much further by uh, an Oxford philosopher called Austin. And Austin's idea was that promising is not just a special kind of mental or linguistic act. It's an act which has real social consequences. And these real social consequences have to do with dispositions. So the, first of all, we have a kind of ritual. When I say I promise to mow your lawn tomorrow, that's a kind of ritual use of language. And ritual will be important later for reasons which will be already clear. It also means that you stake your reputation. In other words, you put yourself on the line. You open yourself up to sanction, to punishment. And that also will be important for what we say later. And the, the reason why we open ourselves up for punishment, as he puts it, we become liable to be rounded on by others. Obligation has to be founded on some possibility of sanction. Whenever you make a promise, there is some possibility that you will be monitored, I typically by the person you make the promise to. And then if you fail to keep the promise, there is typically the possibility that you will be sanctioned. Even if the sanction is only just a, a small amount of negative gossip, or maybe just somebody raises an eyebrow in your presence. Or it may be that you don't get the job you thought you were going to get. There's always the possibility of sanction, and that's the basis for the existence of obligation as something which constrains people's behavior. It has a forcing function on people's behavior. All right, now John Searle was a student of Austin's who created something like a social ontology. He uses the phrase social ontology to describe his own work. So when we perform speech acts like promising or commanding or requesting, then we create new things, claims, obligations, rights, debts, and so on. All of which, he says, are matters of power which hold human groups together. And they do this by providing reasons for action that are independent of what we need physically at the moment. So I don't need to mow your lawn tomorrow physically, not even if I'm thinking about getting paid and I need the money. The reason why the promise has the effect it does is because I've created for myself now a reason for acting tomorrow which is independent of physics and utility. It has to do with a feeling of obligation or the, the existence of an obligation which again has to do with the possibility of sanction. All right, now... In this way, as illustrated by the basic phenomenon of one person promising to do something for some other person, we create social bonds. How is this possible? Well, we are all able to speak language. That is to say, we have a disposition, a competence to speak language. And this position, this position is shared by many other people who speak the same language. And I want to identify a language with the sum of all those shared dispositions. And then a dialect would be a subset. So this is the uh, English language, uh, leaving aside Gaelic, which is up in the upper, upper left. The rest of it is all English, including Manchester, <laughs> which is where I come from. I'm sorry about that. But then there's even Bolton. So... If you listen very carefully, you will hear Bolton coming out of my mouth. 
So clearly there are no sharp boundaries here. There, there, there is some boundary between Bolton and Manchester, dialect-wise, but there are no sharp boundaries because people move around, even in the north. Um, so if we want to have a picture of the English language, it's a kind of disposition. The English language is an instance of a language which is an aggregate of dispositions, which is itself a very large disposition. And then the Lancashire dialect is a part in the dialect which is a part of the language. And the dialect itself is a kind of aggregate of dispositions. And then we can draw another picture which puts the dialect inside the language as a part. We'd have to talk about Jamaican English over here. Not to mention America and Canada. All right. Now, such aggregates of dispositions have to be maintained. And there are mechanisms, things like mothers. And uh, in France, they have a, um, a whole academy for what it's worth, uh, which is a mechanism for maintaining the French language aggregate of dispositions in being. So that um, French can talk about computers. Um, and the law of England is the same. Here we have an aggregate of dispositions on the part of judges and lawyers and police and so, policemen and so forth. So how can mere speaking create social bonds? Because the dispositions to sanction and to monitor are part and parcel with the dispositions to speak. Just as we have dispositions to speak grammatical English, so we have dispositions to monitor people who make promises. They are part and parcel of the same set of social dispositions which human beings living in societies have. <clears throat> now, the next piece of the puzzle has to do with what environments are conducive of certain kinds of activities. And for this, we need a good ontology of environments. And the best that I have um, come up with is the envir environment ontology created by J.J. Gibson, who was a psychologist uh, in the 1950s, uh, 60s, and 70s. He um, invented something called ecological psychology, which is actually closely connected with the neuroanthropology that we uh, had on the screen at the very beginning. Gibson's idea is that we are not white slates. We are, on, on the contrary, tuned by, both by evolution and by acculturation to pick up certain features of the environment in our perception, namely those features which are relevant to our action. So the environment of perception is not a bare physical environment, nor is it a bare sensory environment. Rather, it's an environment of what he calls affordances. And examples would be a glass of beer which affords drinking, or a chair which affords sitting, and so on. So a, an environment is an array of affordances. It's full of things which are meaningful for our actions. And now, Modern-day humans, and all organisms live in environments with affordances, but modern-day humans live in environments with linguistic affordances, which are sounds, and then also printed graphic marks or written marks on paper. And nowadays, of course, counterpart marks on screens and on... Um, what's this? Screen, another kind of screen. I was thinking of screens, not screens. Um, so our world is not just a world of affordances of the physical sort, like chairs and glasses of beer, but also affordances of the linguistic sort, linguistic marks, linguistic sounds, and so forth. And of course, nowadays, it's a world with, uh, with affordances of the digital sort. Keyboards, joysticks, screens, mobile phones, and so on. So we're living in an environment which is enriched digitally, even compared to our parents. I mean, the older um, among us, anyway. All right, and so that, and this has, I think, brought about a neurological re-engineering. So repetitive keyboard action is shaping our brains, and you can 
prove this by looking at the relevant hand parts of brains of people who do a lot of typing. And uh, that's particularly important today because the principal methodology for fighting wars today is repetitive keyboard action, one way or another, or jo sometimes joysticks. All right, so people of old lived in small communities of face-to-face -face interaction where obligations existed. They spoke to each other, they made promises, but these obligations were short-lived and they were local. So they lived in a local environment. Now, environments, even in the olden days, included forcing functions. So there were doors. You had to go through the door in order to get into the house. And there were already things like pathways and signposts in the olden days. Gradually, we got more and more um, uh, creative in the creation of physical forcing functions, so that we now have things like this. But we also have digital forcing functions. The credit rating agencies are digital forcing functions. They force people to be honest. And, um, and, th and that's in part because they're linked to many other digital networks, so that we're being tracked constantly when it comes to financial transactions. And the tracking of those financial transactions then contributes to the effect of the forcing function of the credit rating agency. So digital environments are making people more honest. That's a typical phenomenon of the day. It's not just honesty. It's also forcing people in other directions, um, which having to do with things like reputation. Now, again, the, just as people lived in small communities, so the languages that people used in those small communities created small, simple civil societies. Civil societies in which people had shared interests. Um, and those are the kinds of languages which have been studied primarily by philosophers like Searle and Austin. They were interested in the small-scale speech acts in which people think, did things like make promises. But um, there are entire cultural worldviews that are embodied by the large-scale uses of language created by users of English or Japanese, but also created by sub-communities of each of those communities who are interested in football or who are members of graffiti gangs or who are, in one way or another, bonded by a sub-language, a sub-dialect, an argo, secret code. So we're getting towards terrorism now. This is the key. All right, so Austin and Searle focused on the way language allows individuals to be joined together through simple speech acts. We, but we now have much more complicated networks where people are joined together by not just by speech acts, but also by document acts, things like contracts and military plans. They can be joined together in very large organizations. And these organizations exist because there are many, many small sub-organizations which are joined together by simple speech acts. But because of all the documents holding this structure together, the, the small sub-organizations form a larger whole because of the organizational um, coordination which the documents enable. Now this, as you can see, is the organigram of ISIS. This is the organizational structure of ISIS. And being part of this organizational structure means being changed personally. You are a different person because you are a part of this organizational structure. Just as you're a different person if you, have a f if you, if you care about your Facebook page. I not delete the word just there. That wasn't quite right. All right, so when they become networked, 
in both senses, both in the sense that they become part of an organizational structure and in the sense that they become part of a digital world, then they become changed. So in the old days, we were biological organisms with memories, relatively short-term memories, with skills, with a reputation based on our interactions with other people. But now, we leave reputational trails digitally on the internet. I mean, some of us do. And I do, but not on Facebook. Um, now, what this means is that now people can do new kinds of things. They can make new kinds of plans. They can make plans which extend far beyond their local village or their local university department or whatever it might be. There are new kinds of societies, not just football, but also um, a society of people interested in medieval clavichord music. And families are changed. So the internet enables families to stay together even when they're globally separated. So we're now living in a time when refugees can stay in touch with their family at home on a daily basis because of Skype, for instance. And this is where um, France and Germany and Belgium and other sites of terrorist radicalization fit into the picture. So... In the olden days, well, there was jihad, but jihad was local. People fought wars against Christians or against other religions locally for territorial reasons. But now we have global jihad. We have deterritorialized jihad. Now, I said that um, the beginnings of a philosophical view of terrorism were in the theory of speech acts. So the idea was that a, a terrorist act is a speech act with, a ter with violence attached. So the IRA bombs people in order to send a message to the British government. That's a speech act with, with bombs. Um, there is one view of terrorist action which, which sees terrorist acts as being speech acts directed towards God or towards the religion, towards one's co-religionists. But I think that the correct way of understanding the acts of ISIS in Belgium or in France are in terms of messages to the global jihad, messages, in other words, to the loosely aggregated group of people who are fighting the, jihad, the global jihad. Messages to demonstrate your um, good faith, your loyalty, your belonging, and messages of a sort which uh, enable a feeling of group cohesion which is quite unique and very, very strong for reasons which we will see. All right, so Atran published a paper clock called The Global Jihadi Archipelago, which I strongly recommend. And he starts with football. Um, a physically stimulating and intimate group action which creates a small cultural niche, a band of brothers. Now, in football, it's not such a glorious course unless you have a really good team. Um, but here it is a glorious course. So they see themselves as being like a band of football fans, but with a sublime, global, glorious course. Um, so, these are not acts of senseless, horrific violence. They're not even, according to Atron, primarily religious in their motivation. Rather, they are creating something, a, an international jihadi archipelago that will eventually unite to destroy the present world to create a new old world of universal justice and peace under the Prophet's banner. Now, the, the important thing is that these are small groups who gain group co cohesion by the fact that their team is really wonderful. And um, 
So the, I only have two more slides now. So the, the basis for the ontology of terrorism, terrorism is going to be on two levels. On one level, we're talking about loose networks of family and friends and fellow travelers who become joined together by very strong bonds of social co cohesion, which lead to ultimate sacrifices because they feel themselves part of a global jihad. They are very loose, but they are at the same time cohesive to an almost infinite degree. But then on the second level, actions like the um, Paris attacks were coordinated and financed and planned. And so this is a separate level. There is the level of group cohesion, and then there is the level of the hard men who do the financing. So we have two levels for the ontology. Um, there is the level of radicalization, ritual oaths, dreaming ecology, and there is the level of collective planning, financing, and so forth. And I think that is indeed the final slide. Yes. Thank you very much. Yes. Um, I was um, thinking about these, um, these uh, performative acts like promising and such like. I mean, they didn't make sense in the context of institution. For the example, baptizing. Yep. It wouldn't make sense unless there was an institution called the church. I promised to pay the bearer of this note five pounds, I like you. That only makes sense if there is a banking institution. So, in a way, my, as, as you um, spoke so eloquently, of course, uh, I thought that maybe the institutions come, I mean, these speech acts presuppose the institutions within which they make sense. The second point is um, yeah, I mean, all this networking. I mean, I'm reminded of someone who said, I've got 2,000 Facebook friends, and then I have no one to go out to see a film with. Um, to be very much connected. Uh, as well, this is a sideline, really. But, um, and thirdly, I mean, I thought of this uh, really good final scheme of terrorism, something which is left out with these sacred texts, which are so important, obviously misinterpreted, but but they do uh, shape up certain uh, terrorist minds. Good. So one of Searle's favorite examples of, of, of the way in which speech acts create new entities with uh, power associations, uh, which are not physical power associations, but which are social or deontic power associations, is the example of the Declaration of Independence. Now, there is an institution of nationhood, but the colonists in Virginia and Philadelphia and so on didn't have nationhood. All they had was a piece of paper and some signatures and the declaration. But they managed to persuade the world and history that they were actually a nation state, and thereby they became a nation state. So you can have speech acts which are effective, without institutional backing. But surely there was an ideology of enlightenment, which in a way allowed... Ah, but ideology and institution are two different things. Well... So I agree that they, there was an ideology which was behind them, but then there's an ideology here. So I would say that the, the, the performative acts, that's a good term actually because it doesn't involve the use of speech, the performative acts of the radicalized terrorists are not resting on institutions, they are resting on ideology. And I would say that that is indeed in some ways parallel to the Declaration of Independence. Now, with regard to the, um, the Facebook person with many friends but no friends, um, I think that the idea of the lone wolf is probably uh, mistaken, that, that there, there, are, there is always an environment of other people. Um, certainly in the examples known to me, we're dealing with people who really do have friends. In more than friends, they have bro bands of brothers, or brothers and sisters now. 
And then thirdly, on the sacred texts. Now, Atran thinks that the religious component of jihadism or radical jihad is, it should not be overemphasized. I think that the Quran and the Hajib and so on are props. They're very important props. Um, they're religious props, of course, but most of the people who engage in jihad in France or Belgium or Germany do not read the inside of the Quran, as I understand it. They know about the Quran, but they, they haven't studied the Quran, they haven't learned Arabic. Uh, I agree. I would say the problem. Uh, the problem with Atran is, is a typical, but he's American, Western based. He doesn't even speak French. He gives the interviews in, in English. Uh, he's a typical Western uh, minded person who cannot really understand our religion, the importance of religion. Okay, so I would. That's my personal view. Okay, so actually, I think I may be persuadable that you're right and he's wrong in this respect. Um, I. I just assumed that he was France-based, but that I, I had, I knew that he was an American, but... He gives his interviews in English. Yeah, that's true, that's true. Can't yeah. speak French. Yeah. So. Well, I, 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 I will look at those phrases again with some degree of skepticism. But some Americans understand religion, I think. Yes? Yeah, thank you, uh, and just to pick up on this point, you said it's... it's it's not an institution, but it's ideology. But I mean, performative acts or speech acts, they're not brute facts, they're institutional facts in using Australian language. Ah, oh, well, there's, there's a. So, so they are. Yeah, they, yeah. And it's a defined institution, not as some kind of big organized uh, um, thing, such as, a, such yeah. as a religion or, 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 or a central bank or whatever, which is the commonplace, but rather simply, simply as a system of rules yeah. which are shared. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. But I was I think you too were using the word institution to mean something like a system of laws rather than just local. Uh, but if we if we view institutions more broadly as, as a shared yeah, then system it's, of rules, yeah. The yeah. ideologies are yeah. an instance of yeah, yeah. 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 Well, I'm not sure I'm not I would like to hang on to the distinction between institutions and ideologies, but that's probably because I'm not using the word institution in cell sense. So you're right, I should be more careful there. Uh, if you use institution in cell sense, it's trivial that every performative act is part of an institution. And I guess what, the way I would deal with that would be in terms of linguistic competencies. Competencies associated with linguistic competencies are rule-governed in ways which mirror the rules of language. And that's what makes them institutions in cell sense. Can I follow up on that? Please. Just, just wondering... Um... So there's a basic form of ontology, uh, and, and picking up what we just said, I mean, wouldn't a sort of general institutional ontology be also somehow necessary to, to allow us to, to think about various kinds of social phenomena, including terrorism and other kinds of... Yeah, that's, uh, that, I'm working on that, but basic formal ontology is designed to be completely generic. Right. So every kind of entity should be capable of being positioned under one of the headings within BFO. And is, so you may not like this, but um, now let's take organizations because they're a bit easier. I think that organizations are aggregates of their members. Now, of course, they, there, are, there have to be rules, there have to be positions, statuses, uh, authorities. Um, but in the end, an organization is an aggregate of people. It, it, plus, um, which fits into BFO without any problem. It's just the material end. I said you wouldn't like it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if, you, if you think about institutions as systems of rules, and you specify that in certain cases, your systems of rules include boundary conditions, membership conditions, and hierarchical conditions in the other organization. No, because those rules have to be satisfied. So again, we have a language difficulty here. So if we think of institutions as systems of rules, then clearly they're not aggregates of people because you, the people need to satisfy or obey or follow the rules. So how, what is a system of rules in the BFO sense? Uh, it is a disposition, complex disposition. 
Uh, and it's more complex than it seems because the rules tell you what to do. They don't necessarily tell you how to sanction the people who break the rules. That may be another system of rules. But that was, no, this, I don't want to pick them. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, just trying to understand how this framework would be useful to understand um, either why people become radicalized or why they commit radical acts. Because we know these are two separate things. Half of SOAS students are radical, but they don't commit yeah. radical violent acts. So, how, how would this framework help us? Because I did see much here about the elephant, like foreign policy, so Western yeah. foreign policy, yeah. and how this just makes people quite angry. I don't know how this would. Okay, so perhaps um, mistakenly, given the contributions of our friend at the back there, who I presume does speak French, to the fit. I was focusing on Atran's view, and the reason for that was because my colleagues in France, uh, or my colleague in France, um, who is uh, familiar with the French scenario, he, he thinks that Atran has the most sophisticated contributions. Now, Atran does not, in the, in the works of Atran that I've been studying, he does not address those kinds of questions. So we, we have two kinds of questions. One is, how, what are the mechanisms which lead to certain people becoming radicalized? That is the question which is burning the, the, the brains of French authorities now. They want to try and identify what makes certain people become radicalized. Now, well, no, radical... Not everyone who is radicalized commits a yeah, violent act, exactly. but everyone who is radicalized becomes more likely to commit a violent act than someone who is not radicalized. Yeah. Uh, that's almost by definition, I think. That's what becoming radicalized means. It means you're risk, you become a risk factor for violent acts. How would you define radicalized? Um, like I said, this is science. Everything radical here, from the way economics is thought, the way politics is thought. <laughs> But then there is, um, you are taught to contest things in a certain way. Yeah, but I think that's just becoming radical or becoming trained to think like a radical. I don't think it's what they mean by radicalized. In the... I think the French authorities know why people become radical and why they do certain things. I think the problem is they never address the serious issues of, say, racism and xenophobia and other issues. So... Yeah, but you're, you're addressing now something on a completely different level. So I am addressing a data mining problem. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You have a lot of data about behaviors of people and so forth, about meetings, about locations of mosques and so forth, uh, about education, about teachers, mothers, yeah. ways of dressing. You have a lot of data. All of the obvious clues to predicting radicalization don't work. So one clue is that you'd be a Muslim. Yeah. That doesn't predict. So is there some way you can dig more deeply into this data in order to make predictions which really do have some value? The larger question that you're raising now may fit into that smaller question. So it could be, and the data would include, for instance, data about American actions in the Middle East and about American president elections, yeah. almost certainly. Uh, <laughs> can one there find a causal association. So if there is a president, presidential election of a certain sort, then in the following days or weeks, more and more of these people become radicalized. Perhaps that would be a question of the sort which would fit into the scope of this work. Um, can we stop there being presidential elections in America in order to cure radicalization in France? That's a harder question. I, you know, it's interesting. I mean, there are a lot of things that we could discuss in this question. It seems like you're, fine. you're looking for certain indicators, which is, again, it, it's, it definitely it's interesting. I'm just, I'm just not sure that from that you can be able to predict certain things, because as we've seen with a lot of these violent things that happen, people are very good at masking their actions and their intentions. So, if so, you're looking for particular indicators, then... Yeah, I, ha I am... Oh also not at all sure that this will lead to anything useful. Uh, but it's a, it, we have this problem. It's been, the need has been identified. Proposals are being requested 
this is a proposal. Now, it has worked in other similar areas. Um, it's very hard to make predictions about individual teenagers. Yeah. Um, so this is a really hard area, but I like a hard problem. There's also the case of a far-right terrorism, of course, um, uh, Breivik in uh, Norway. That would have been very uh, hard. Team like three, it's a five years ago in yeah. the States, yeah. and um, they tend to be, on the whole, neglected. But it's a far-right networks. Yes, yeah, so actually, if you look at the literature on terrorism, they're not neglected so much. They are included within the catalogue. I think um, uh, also, I think right now, the British government is desperate to, to triangulate, because in order to justify their, their um, intrusive uh, laws and policies towards the Islam Muslims, they try to yeah. balance it out right. by targeting the far right. And, uh, well, maybe, as a time, I agree with Noam Chosky, here we got the extreme centre, uh, like gentlemen there were saying, you know, if some policies are checked for emanate from the state. Yeah, I'm absolutely sure that you're both right in these respects. Um, I'm, I'm really focusing on, and I, I, I have to confess, I know less about the state of terrorist radicalization in England than I do about the state of radical radicalization in France and Belgium and Germany. Um, I, I know. I don't watch TV so much in England because I'm not here very often, but I have been in France and Germany recently. And there is a lot of concern in both France and Germany about this phenomenon, and it's a phenomenon. One in four young people in France is sympathetic to ISIS. Now, that's not true, I believe, of um, Breivik types. I think there's no groundswell of enthusiasm right-wing terrorism amongst typical teenagers in England. Well, I mean, it depends how you define that, but anyway, I guess that's a different <laughs> discussion because you could argue that systemic racism is, is an issue. And I know, but it's so not... You're asking, yeah. the point is you're asking a particular question about... Yeah, so this is, this is ISIS is a violent organization, yeah, and sympathy for a violent organization is a very specific. I don't know those statistics, but it's one in four, I'm sure that. Yeah, well, maybe we shouldn't trust anything Atran says because he doesn't speak French. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. What about shifting boundaries? You gave the example of Lancashire and languages. Yeah, I can hear a certain Lancashire. And language. they've definitely changed over my lifetime. Yes. You used to be able to identify them about six miles apart. Yeah, that's right. That has shifted significantly. Yeah, there are some nice maps on the web. Of Cambridge linguistics. So, how would the system cope with that? The other aspect that occurs to my mind is um, where do ethics come in, and the, um, i.e., the regulation of such things? In finance, for example, algorithms cannot be regulated on many of our systems of finance things, and that's a finance control thing supposedly to keep us all honest and wise, etc. And, um, yeah, I think that's enough for me. Okay, so, so other thought, which I like. actually, I think that it's two sides of the same coin. So the way you keep track of how dialect boundaries change is by looking at how different mechanisms for dialect preservation become more or less important. So nowadays, TV is by far, or maybe TV plus internet surfing, are by far the most important influences on the ways people speak. And then with regard to regulating algorithms, that too is, is a, a dynamic thing. So what happens is that the credit rating agencies have algorithms which don't work quite so well. And they learn that because they're constantly monitoring the, the effectiveness of their algorithms. And so they change the algorithms to make them work better and then monitor again and then change them again. So algorithms are evolving constantly. But what about the ethical? I'm trying to avoid. Yes, I'm trying I to understand. avoid. That. I'm just wondering about the predictive kind of capabilities of this. Um, we do actually know a lot about kind of the characteristics of European terrorists, and we know that you know they don't have um, links to Islamic heritage necessarily. They're male, yeah. well educated. Not, not the, 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 actually. I think that the number of women involved is increasing, and it's already nearly fifty percent. Extremists. Women, no, are, even, women are the mark, like we're behind it and we're thinking it. 
them even. Um, okay. <laughs> they're the I, committing the physical acts. Yeah. Um, but, uh, well educated, disenfranchised, ostracized, but at the same time, there's some sort of um, contagion to it where you need to come into contact with either someone on social media or a kind of figurehead who's promoting the ideas yeah. of it. Um, and they're all things that we can pick up on people's online profiles through geotagging and just the basic language um, on their profiles. Do you think that there's a possibility in the future that this system will be able to pick up all of those variables and map them into hotspots and regions that we should be doing kind of interventions to prevent people you know, following this path and seeing this as their options? I don't know, but the French government thinks that it's worth investing a huge amount of money in strategies like that. Uh, I think you listed all the obvious ones. They've tried all the obvious ones. Now they're trying to be more devious to find out if I there are non-obvious ones. What they're doing ones. is they've been targeting each obvious one one at a time. Right. And it's, it's a much more complex right. mediation right. pattern yeah. than that. Yeah. And think yeah. of the mental illness and domestic violence and the slight yeah. factors that do come into the entire function that they yeah. often leave out and end up... Uh, yeah, so it sounds as if you're on my side. I'm on your side. <laughs> but it's nice to have someone on my side. <laughs> Has there been much research on the, the religious minds? Has anybody particularly with a greater knowledge of religion developed any oncology system? Uh, it's not much, actually. The, the ontology of religion is relatively underdeveloped. Um, this particular kind of analysis has to pay attention to religion more as a social phenomenon rather than a religious and I think they're missing a major aspect. Well, that's what, yeah, that's what the, 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 the French-speaking colleague at the back was suggesting. That we're, we're losing the religion. Mm. And his argument, and the Atran's argument, is that when you interview these people, they don't give much weight to the religious in the traditional sense of the word. Um, they haven't read the Quran. Uh, and many of them come from secular backgrounds in any case. So they are wedded to the band of brothers or sisters uh, as a, like a fan club, like a football fan. Well, that has been evident in the There's certainly a lack of uh, religious literacy. Yeah. Yeah. So there obviously is a re religious component. And I, I think that in Islam anyway, geopolitics and religion are connected together in a way different from the, the way they are in secular countries like Britain. Um. Linking on to that, is there any idea of why? I mean, if you look at you know the Quran versus the Christian Bible versus the Torah and Hindu texts, etc., I mean, the Christian Bible and the Torah certainly have equally, if not strong, messages of violence and hatred. That's the Quran. Why do you, is there any research on why it is that that specific text and that religion is pulling people in to this cycle currently Whereas, you know, the Bible and the Torah aren't so much right now, they have this past. Well, you can think about the Christian wars of religion before the Treaty of Westphalia. Both of them had the same text, but they were fighting each other. For, I think, for nationalistic, uh, territorial reasons, in part at least. Um, and you can think about the IRA. So there, too, there were two sides fighting, sharing the same book. Um, I'm not sure what follows from that. We know that the Christian religion did lead to religious wars, so the Bible led to religious wars. Um, can we say that the Quran similarly led to and is leading to religious wars? I, it's a complicated question. Did it lead to religious wars? So was it the nature of man that led to religious wars? Well, lead to then. Lead, lead to was associated Using in some way with religious wars. <laughs> Um, so I, I can imagine that there were um, military campaigns where the, the leader at the front was holding the Bible in the air. And similarly, I can imagine that there are military campaigns in our own day where the leader at the front was holding the Quran in the air. People hope things for different purposes. That's true. That's one of the reasons why I used the word prop earlier. Mm -hmm. The Quran is a prop. Now it's a religion prop, and that means that religion is still playing a role. Holy book, part of the global 
she had uh, ecology. The world is shaped by the fact this holy book is given us, the word of God. We live in that world. We should fight for that world, making it whole. Thank Professor Smith for charming exposition. Thank you.